Well, yeah, I've been enjoying baseball lately. Um, I'm a little worried that this season, <laughs> they've already had, what, 16 to 20 postponed games in a week and a half because of coronavirus. We'll see. Uh, the announcer for the Twins was joking about how they, a lot of times when baseball players get injured, uh, they say, he's day-to-day. And he was joking the other day, he says, this whole baseball season is day-to-day. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see if they make it to the end. But I've been enjoying it so far. A good number of years ago, I was watching uh, some baseball highlights on, I suppose, ESPN. And one particular highlight uh, stuck out. It was a highlight of a Yankees game. I don't know who they were playing. Um, their rising new star at the time, whose name was Alfonso Soriano, hit a big home run and, um, in this game being highlighted, and he did some showboating as he rounded the bases. When he got back to the dugout, the Yankees manager, who was uh, Joe Torre back then, uh, walked over to him and whispered some things in his ear. And immediately after that, Soriano got much more serious looking, and, and he, uh, he glanced over at some of his teammates with an expression that um, said, whoops, <laughs> I just got in trouble. <laughs> so Joe Torre, the manager, is a, a man I've had respect for despite my intense competitive dislike of the Yankees. Uh, it was pretty clear that uh, the manager, uh, manager Tory there, had come up to his rookie and said something to the effect of, you know, you might get away with showboating on another team, uh, but that is not the way we do things on the Yankees. When a New York Yankee hits a home run, we run the bases with seriousness. This is our business, and it is our business to succeed. I'm sure it was... I don't know what he said, but I think it was something like that. Pretty sure it was something like that. So what Soriano had done there was not the Yankee way. I imagine we can all think of organizations uh, that a person could belong to that would have a a way, a code of conduct attached to it. Uh, The military comes to mind, right? You're going to have a code of conduct attached, uh, you know, if you're in the Marine Corps or whatever, there's going to be a way that you are expected to behave. Well, in our Sunday morning sermon series on Luke these days, uh, we've discovered that Jesus was the initiator of just such a group to belong to, one that had a code of conduct attached to it. It was the group of his followers, the people who were learning from him and wanting to imitate him and obey his teaching. And in fact, this group of Jesus' followers uh, we saw in an earlier sermon would later be called people who belonged to the way. So as we've been saying here, Jesus was the initiator of the way. And and the way did involve a code of conduct, a way to live. The way also was a person. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. So as we've uh, transitioned in our sermons on Luke from the birth stories of Jesus and John the Baptist, and we've moved into the early days of Jesus' public ministry as a man, uh, we've seen him beginning to explain this way that he was inviting people to follow. Oh, and we've observed that his, his way was um, uh, really safe and easy, right? Well, no. <laughs> we've... Uh, We've seen Jesus asking people to drop everything and give a full life dedication to his cause and and following him. Uh, We've heard Jesus teaching people back then, and by extension still to us today, we are also called to this. We've heard him teaching people to love their enemies. Wow. Do good to those who hate you. And uh, we've also been learning that if you're going to be a Jesus follower, you had better start preparing yourself to be willing to hang out with people that society might tell you you shouldn't hang out with. Jesus is the fixer, and not only does he fix our brokenness, but he asks us to find broken people and bring, bring them to him. So these are all things we've been learning about the way. And as we look this morning uh, at uh, the end of Luke chapter 5 into Luke chapter 6, we're going to see some additional things about this way uh, that uh, Jesus brought to us. So let's uh, dig into that. We're going to begin in the 33rd verse of of Luke chapter 5. It'll be on the screen for you, of course. The passage says this, 
They, and, and, and this would be the Pharisees and other Jewish leaders, they said to Jesus, you know, John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray. So do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours, Jesus, go, just go on eating and drinking. What gives? And Jesus answered, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and in those days they will fast. Fasting in Old Testament times uh, had been associated with pleading to God uh, for the forgiveness of sin, associated with mourning or, you know, crying out to him, you know, Lord, hear us, hear our prayer. Uh, But Jesus says to the Pharisees here, you know, seriously, guys, I'm the Messiah who you've been waiting for for thousands of years. Uh, This is the time to celebrate, not to mourn, not to fast. Would you uh, be crying and, and fasting if you were at a wedding ceremony? No, that'd be totally inappropriate. And it's totally inappropriate for me to ask my disciples to fast while I'm with them. Time is coming when I'll be gone and, and then they will fast. But, but now is not that time. And then after that, Jesus began to say some things about the way. Let's look at verse 36. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new for they say, oh, the old is better. What we learn here about the way that Jesus was launching, is that Jesus was bringing about something new here. Yeah, Jesus was part of the story of God's special interactions with the Israelite people, which was both amazing and very important. But with the coming of Jesus, God was communicating and doing some new things as well. Uh, Jesus wasn't throwing all the old stuff in the garbage. It, it's more like he was fulfilling it, uh, like he was taking it the next step. And he tried to help people see uh, that there was new stuff coming now through these analogies. And he said, hey, you're not going to take a piece of a new garment and make a patch for an old one. It's going to look goofy on the old garment. And now you just ripped a hole in the new one. That doesn't make any sense. Let the old be old and the new be new. And you're not going to pour new wine, which needs to ferment still, into old, inflexible wineskins because they would burst as that fermentation process happens. No, you've got to put new wine into new, flexible wineskins. So Jesus was trying to prepare people that following him was going to mean they were going to need to flex. They were going to need to uh, think in some new directions. That wasn't going to be so easy for some of these people. (laughs) To be fair, God had sent a very strong message to the Israelites in in Old Testament times requiring absolute adherence. Although there was, we have seen a way for them uh, to receive mercy from the Lord as well. But it had been a very strong word from God to Israel. And so these old ways were pretty ingrained. Changing them was going to be difficult. And Jesus indicated as much in what he said in in verse 39 there where, you know, basically he said, you know, some of you are going to drink this new wine and you're going to say, the old was better. (laughs) You're going to, you're going to miss the new stuff I'm, I'm bringing. You're going to miss these important changes. So be ready for change, Jesus was saying here. Jesus' way was going to uh, bring something new. If we keep reading, uh, we'll go into chapter 6. Let's do that. So this is uh, Luke 6, verse 1. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain and rub them in their hands and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? You may or may not know that the Sabbath was one of those old, strong commands from God to the Israelite people. They were to take a day of rest each week, a day called the Sabbath, and on that day they were not to do any work. Uh, These Pharisees, these Pharisees at least believed 
that Jesus' disciples were violating that Sabbath law here by pulling a few heads of grain uh, off the crops in the fields they were walking near and eating them. Let's continue reading. Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus refers to Scripture there, which is always a good idea when you're debating morals with Pharisees. Uh, And he reminds them of a story in which the great King David went... uh, into the, 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 well, he, he was at the tabernacle and he was allowed by an Israelite priest to eat some of the consecrated bread. So that's bread that had been uh, used in the tabernacle and was then only lawfully to be eaten by priests. But David was hungry and in need and so the priest allowed that. <clears throat> and here we see the next descriptor of the way that we're going to learn from Jesus here today. The way of Jesus was going to be about the spirit of the law more so than the letter of it. The way of Jesus was going to be about the spirit of the law rather than the letter of it. All right, so you all know that the state of Minnesota has um, suggested this summer that kids stay off playgrounds. I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. Has this been an easy thing to do to stay off playgrounds this summer, Maya and Greta? No, we've had some discussions about that in our house. (laughs) But for the most part, we have tried to to follow the guidance for reasons I gave you last Sunday. Um, In particular, I really just don't want my kids to get sick. No, I said for the most part, we followed the guidance. There were maybe, I don't know, three times this summer where we took the kids over to the oldest playgrounds in Madison. So these are the old Creekers, the one over by the farmer's market, the one over by Lou T. Fisk. Anna and I figured, nobody goes to those, (laughs) right? Uh, There was very little chance that our children were going to get sick there, or if they had somehow been infected, that they were going to give that infection to anybody else. So we figured we were well within the spirit of the law of that don't use playground suggestion, recommendation. The one time that I had the kids over at that playground by the farmer's market, um, I was pushing them on the swings, and somebody I don't know drove by in a pickup truck, and he honked his horn at me and gave me a fist bump like he was cheering me on. (laughs) Figured he was uh, probably cheering me for going against the guidance of the, the state. Sticking it to the man! kind of felt bad because that was not my intention at all. I've really been trying to abide by the directives. And in this case, I felt like I was within the spirit of them. But he thought I was sticking it to the man. (laughs) Yeah! Okay, so, well, there had been a a law in Israel that only priests were to eat the consecrated bread, Uh, but it was deemed lawful by this particular priest in the story Jesus referred to there for David and his men to take some of that bread because they had been in need. And I I guess we can assume that the priest got it right since Jesus is uh, quoting this story in that way. So the spirit of the law and um, that consecrated bread law was to show reverence to God, right? And, and uh, to, to revere his holiness by not treating that bread like normal bread. But exceptions could be made, apparently, if the bread was going to be used for good purpose. So similarly, similarly the, the spirit of the law behind the Sabbath command was to ensure that human beings would actually get rest in our busy lives. It's important for our bodies. God made us. He knows that. And he wanted that for us. It's good for our bodies and our souls. Sabbath was also designed by God to be a day where people would uh, reflect on their relationship with him. That's also an important thing. So the Sabbath law was a good law. But it had become, by the time of Jesus, to some extent anyway, kind of a prison There were these endless debates about what constituted work that you were not supposed to be doing on the Sabbath, and it got into all this ridiculous detail. 
And uh, Jesus reminded people elsewhere in Scripture uh, that, you know, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This was supposed to be a day of rest for you. A good thing, but you, you've made it all so rigid. Be about the spirit of this law, not the letter of it. You know, my disciples are hungry, and grabbing some grain off of these plants, it hardly counts as work. <laughs> right? Come on. Luke then includes another story uh, on the same topic. So here, here's the next verse, verse 6. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful to do on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? He looked around at all of them and then said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. So, similar point here, right? Uh, Be about the spirit of the law, not the letter of it. And Jesus, uh, again, saying, in essence, God asked you to have a day of rest, but it remains okay to do good on the Sabbath. Man, don't, if you have an opportunity to do some good, don't wait till the next business day. Take care of it now. Certainly, you must know that God would allow a person to be healed of a terrible affliction on, on the Sabbath. Boy, the, the Pharisees just couldn't see that, though. They were so wrapped up in their rules and their regulations. They should have had joy in their hearts, right? Seeing a man healed of a shriveled hand, but instead it was anger. So much anger that they began already this early in Jesus' ministry, began to think about how they might kill him. Our passage today here says that they they were furious and they began to discuss what they might do to Jesus. But in the same story over in Mark, it says that the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. This hatred for Jesus had built up real quickly. If you've been here in, in these Luke sermons, let's think back for just a second. People had not been so happy about Jesus' assertion that uh, Believing non-Jews were going to be accepted into the kingdom of God over unbelieving Jews. Hadn't been so happy about that one. They really hadn't been happy with Jesus' claim to be able to forgive sins because only God can forgive sins. That was blasphemy, and blasphemy is punishable by death. In their minds. They they also uh, didn't like how Jesus hung out with sinners and tax collectors, right? They didn't like that very much. And now, on top, of all, on top of all of it, he's breaking the Sabbath law. We got to take him out. And, and they were unable to see the irony in all this, right? Here they are condemning a man for healing on the Sabbath while they, on the Sabbath, are plotting how to kill a man. Well, here is some of this newness that the way was bringing to people. At least it would have seemed new to some of the Jews of Jesus' time. The way was going to be one of paying attention to the spirit of the law over the letter of it. This does not mean, however, that law was not going to mean anything in Jesus' new way. On the contrary, we've Already said, the way included a code of conduct to live by, and Jesus was very serious about obedience to that code. Skip with me now over to the end of the the sixth chapter. Uh, we'll, We'll hit verse 46 here, where we read Jesus saying, Why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I'll show you what they're like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. 
But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. If you follow the way, Jesus says here, if you obey its code of conduct, you're going to find that you are able to stand no matter what life throws at you. If you don't follow the code, there is nothing else to stand on and life will defeat you. The commands matter. Yeah, we're, we're to pay more attention to the spirit of the commands than the letter of them, but the spirit of those commands, very important to be following. Why do you call me Lord, but don't do what I say, Jesus asked. God's laws matter greatly in the way. Two more descriptions of the way coming at you, and this first one is quick. We read verses 30, 43 to 45 of chapter 6 now. Verse 43. Jesus said, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People don't pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So here's another quick description of Jesus' way. The way is about what is internal rather than what is external. The Pharisees did a lot for show, it seems. In fact, I read this week that when they were fasting, they would put something on their face to make them look more pale so that everyone would know that they were fasting. <laughs> and Jesus once shouted out to them, Woe to you! you! You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will be clean as well. Have you ever met anyone in your life who was all about the religious show, but maybe whose uh, internal life didn't line up with that show? I'll bet you have, because this is common. Any of us can fall into this, <laughs> this uh, trap, this scenario. Uh, and I hope the person you're thinking about right now figured that out over time and straightened it out. But yeah, many people practice religion by making sure that they appear to others to be super religious, following all the rules, but looking good on the outside and not being good on the inside is not going to count for much with God. God looks at the heart. Thing is that if, you're, if what's going on in your heart is good, you are going to look like a Christ follower uh, on the outside. That's what Jesus was saying in, in, in this passage we just read. Good, healthy trees, they bear good fruit. So the way that Jesus taught focuses on the internal rather than the external. And then to our final passage for the morning, kind of working backwards here, we jump back to Luke 6, verse 37. Jesus taught, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So here are some very practical instructions uh, for, from the way initiator for us this morning. Uh, don't judge people, he says. Forgive. Give. If we want God to forgive us our sins rather than judge and condemn us, we need to forgive people rather than judge and condemn them. If we want God to give us good things, then we need to be ready to give good things to other people. Last part of verse 38 is a little confusing. Look at that one with me. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use... So it will be measured to you. Let's say you're back in uh, living in Jesus' era and you're going to purchase some grain. So one seller might just pour grain in your bucket and say, have a good day, be well. But another seller might fill your bucket and then use his hands to press that grain down 
so he can get a little more in there. And then after doing that, shakes it so it settles even more and he can get a little more in there. And then for his final effort, he pours until it's overflowing. Then he hands it to you and says, have a good day, be well. Which cellar are you going back to next week? <laughs> okay. This is the picture Jesus gives to us of how giving we should be to others. We give generously. But the command that is most focused on in this section of the chapter, we'll, we'll see a little more on it here in just a moment, was the command there that Christ gave to not judge. So we also will focus in a little bit more on that one. Do not judge. This was personal for Jesus. Think about this. He was constantly surrounded by Pharisees, judging him all the time. Can you imagine living in that scenario where everyone's watching your every move and your every thought and just... So this was personal for him. People who belong to the way, he said, are not to judge. We're to keep our eyes on ourselves. Started reading through the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis with Maya, which I had been looking forward to doing once my daughters are old enough. And I'm going to be careful not to give away any spoilers here because we're only halfway through the first book. So no spoilers. I won't, I won't give anything away, Maya. But I do remember from my earlier readings, my earlier readings of, of this series, there are a couple of points in the series where some of the characters get talking to Aslan about the wrong things that someone else was doing. And Aslan would say something to them like, don't spend time thinking about them. Let me deal with them. You spend time thinking about you. <laughs> Got to keep our eyes on ourselves. Very easy to fall into this trap as well for all of us. To have a, a critical spirit. Why is it that that feels good to us to be critical of other people? Not quite sure why that is. To point out the faults or inadequacies of others. But this one can sneak up on us. Uh, do you find that you're spending a lot of time thinking about what other people are doing wrong? Or about how you would have gone about some project in a different and much better way than that person went about it. And maybe you find that the, those aren't just thoughts, but those are actually words coming out of your mouth, uh, either to the person or maybe to someone else about that person. Again, we, we need to guard against this. We're all susceptible to this. Don't judge, Jesus says. In fact, we're supposed to be encouragers. We're supposed to be building people up rather than tearing them down. So look for the things that people are doing well and let those be the words coming out of our mouths. There is a time and situation, of course, where judging is appropriate. Like I've said here before, if you're choosing a babysitter for your kids, you ought to be doing some judging about that babysitter's character. Uh, if you're choosing a pastor or people for your elder board at your church, you ought to be doing some judgment of the person's character. You know, there may be church discipline scenarios where judgment is warranted, but for the most part, the everyday types of interactions that we have in our lives, we are to be keeping our eyes on ourselves rather than other people. Typically, there's enough going on in our own lives that needs fixing that we don't need to be spending time straightening other people out. And that's the next part in Luke, uh, verse 41. Jesus said, uh, why are you looking at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and paying no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? Hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye and then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. When Billy Graham died, I read a quote from his, one of his daughters, his daughter Virginia, about him. And she said, Daddy always taught us that we are to love, the Holy Spirit convicts, and God judges. I like that quote. Great way to think about it. It is our primary job to love. We are to speak truth, but we're to speak truth in love. And then it's the Holy Spirit's role to convict and God's role to judge. And so we leave that to him. Well, I'm assuming that if you're here this morning 
or listening to the sermon online, uh, that you are likely listening to this because you have interest in following this way that Jesus brought to the world, or at least you're checking it out. Well, we've added some new pieces to the puzzle for you today about what the way looks like and what it ought to look like in the lives of those who belong to it. It's deeper and more life-giving than any military code of conduct. It's of way more significance than the Yankee way. In addition to Jesus' call for a full life dedication to him, in addition to his call to us to love our enemies, in addition to his command to intentionally seek out broken people and bring them to him, we can now add these five items to the list. Jesus was bringing something new with his way. We should be aware of that. The way is more about following the spirit of God's laws rather than the letter of them. But the spirit of that law is very important. We are to obey the code of conduct Jesus gives to us. Number four, the way is focused on the internal rather than the external. And finally, number five, those who follow the way are to be generous givers and we are not to judge others. This is the way. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we call you Lord because uh, not only are you the creator of the universe, but we want you to be our Lord. We want you to be our master. We want to sit at your feet daily and learn from you and have you guide us. Help us to put these things into practice, Lord, the things that we've looked at today. Help us to remember to be spirit of the law people rather than letter of the law people. Correspondingly, uh, Holy Spirit, remind us to be focused on the internal things more than the external things. To not be so concerned what we look like to others, but to be very concerned about what's going on in our hearts and minds, making sure that they are aligned with your will and your instruction. Enable us to obey the spirit of the laws that you have given to us. Uh, for they remain life-alteringly important. Help us to follow this code of conduct that you've given to us in the way. And then lastly, uh, remind us, Lord, to keep our eyes on ourselves and be focused, about, uh, focused on how uh, we can improve in our walks rather than sitting around thinking about all the ways others ought to improve. Remove from us, Lord, any critical spirit and replace it with an encouraging spirit. Your way, Lord God, it is amazing, it is lovely, it is good, it is wise, and blessed we will be if we follow it. We give you honor today. Amen. Amen. And with that, We're going to sing happy birthday to all you August birthday people. And right after the happy birthday, and again, if you are, if you have, I I never have my wallet in here whenever we do this. But you may, and you may want to give a little bit. It goes to missions, and you can place it in the four baskets if you have an August birthday. We're going to sing happy birthday to you, and then uh, we want to keep the family of God song alive too, so we'll, uh, we'll sing that after happy birthday. We're not going to shake hands or anything. Let's do those two things and then I'll dismiss this for the day. Why don't you stand? All right, we know it. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Nicole. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Slides in, but we know this one.
It is great to be part of the family of God. If you want prayer uh, today, uh, Greg or Carmen will be up in the front here, maybe in the back in the library area. Don't forget the offering plates. There's two plates today, one for benevolence, one for regular. They will be marked. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God be with you all. Amen. For those of you who haven't dismissed already, the rest of you are dismissed. <laughs> Thanks for being here.